Irish Griffith, your code enforcement officer here. I'm sure you've seen my smiling, confused face at the planning board meetings many, many times now. And I've discovered there seems to be a little issue about understanding how the planning board hearing procedures go, and the same for site walks, actually. So I wanted to kind of cover that so those of you that choose to get involved will understand what to expect and what the do's and don'ts are to help make these meetings run smoothly for everybody. So I want to start with site walks. When we do a site walk, it's advertised, it's open to the public, you're more than welcome to attend. However, a site walk is actually just an informational gathering thing for the planning board and for the general public. The goal of a site walk is not to ask a ton of questions and have everything answered on site. The goal of a site walk is for the board members, myself, and any members of the public to walk through. We'll have developers stake out certain areas that we want to see. Um, the questions, we try to limit questions at site walks to, hey, where is XYZ going to be located? The reason for that is the board needs to have a very good visual in their mind when they're looking at this application before them in the meetings. Now, if you go to a site walk and you have any questions, we ask that you do not specifically address it to the developer. We do that for a couple of reasons. One, because honestly, not every question is appropriate to be asked. It may have been answered in the application. The planning board may not need to have that question asked on site. It may be more appropriate for a public hearing if you haven't had a chance to review the packet as it is online. Um, we try to keep those site meetings very short, especially considering that we're starting to lose daylight early. So if you have a question, we ask that you approach the chair let him know you have a question and what that question is, and he will determine if that is a question that needs to be answered on site or if it should be best left over to public hearing. So that's the long and short of the site walks. When you come to the public hearing, there is a very strict planning board procedure for the public hearing, and there are several reasons for that. So the chair, or in the chair's absence, the vice chair or acting chair, will open the public comments. So he'll call on the applicant to present the project. The applicant typically gives just a quick little overview of this is my project, this is where we walked, X, Y, Z. Then the chair will give the public a chance to speak. Each member of the public is allowed five minutes to speak. If you wish to have additional time, then you can ask and the, the chair is allowed to grant you an additional three minutes. Now, the reason for this is because there's a lot of public discourse and we try to keep things succinct. The developer and the board members are all writing down a lot of information as these things come through, a lot of questions to make sure that things are followed up on, and we're trying to make sure that everybody has time to get their questions answered during this procedure. So then once the public hearing is closed, it's very important that the public not try to speak um, when, you're, when you're speaking, you go up to the podium, we ask you to give your name and your address, and we ask that you speak into the microphone. All of these meetings are televised, and as wonderful as our BCM staff is, they are not miracle workers, and if you're not speaking into the microphone, they can't pick it up, the people at home cannot hear it, and that leaves a good portion of the town at a disadvantage as far as having all the information that the people here have. So if you're speaking from the audience, it's kind of chaotic noise. It makes it very difficult for the members at home or anybody participating over Zoom to hear. And it also makes it hard for the planning board members to hear the information they need from a developer. And as I'm sure we all agree, we want them to have full information before they make any decisions. So when the public hearing is over, the chair will open the old business so the chair will request that the developer answer as many questions as possible and most of our presenters take their own notes on questions and try to answer them right out the gate. Um, there may be situations where the board, the board members do not feel that a question that was asked was appropriate or needs an answer. So they may not request that that be answered. It has not happened yet in the year that I've been here, but making you aware it's a possibility. So after the developer has answered all the questions that the public presented, then it is the board's time to ask the developer's questions, and then it is the board's time to deliberate on the project. 
So we ask that the public not interject commentary over that because it's, that's when the board's really doing their important work. So just to reiterate, it's best for you to come with your questions in hand, kind of planned out because you get five minutes to speak for the first time, three minutes additional if required, if you request it and the board feels it's appropriate. Um, I do also want to tell you that if you're coming to give comment at a public hearing, your best bet uh, to be most effective at these public hearings are two things. First of all, realize that the planning board has to go based on the ordinances. They are legally required to do so and not doing so actually could open the town to a lawsuit from a developer. So as much as I feel it's important for a developer to understand how neighbors feel about a project, um, if you know that there is a very good chance that this is going to go through because it meets all of the ordinance requirements, my suggestion is to think about how making this project more pleasant for you might be possible, whether it's additional screening, whether it's the large oak tree that you're hoping they don't have to cut down and, and mentioning that. Uh, anything developers really want to help with anything they can to make abutters feel comfortable with what they're putting in the neighborhood. Um, but that being said, the planning board can only prohibit a development or a conditional use or site plan from going through if it fails to meet a performance standard or a particular portion of our ordinance. So if you really feel like somebody is stepping way out of line with their development, my suggestion is to hop on the town website, look at the land use ordinance, particularly uh, it's page 116 is where the performance standards for conditional use and site plan review start. Look at those performance standards and see if you feel that the project meets all of these things. It's very important when it's in your neighborhood that you understand why the planning board has to make the decisions they do. And when you look at all of these conditional use site plan performance standards, those apply to subdivisions as well because a subdivision is basically a conditional use of a parcel. So if you feel that it doesn't meet the uh, landscape enhancement or preservation performance standard, for example, bring that to the board's attention. Tell them how you feel it's failing to meet that or what you feel they need to do to meet that. That will help further your cause a lot more. Okay? If you have any questions about how the planning board runs, you feel free to reach out to us. Planning at BerwickMaine.org. Thank you. <music>